Hello, and welcome back to The Path. My guest today is Craig Mason. Craig Mason, since they started his career in Japanese Goju-Ryu and then moved into Arnis, a Filipino martial art. In this episode today, we talk about the differences between the different styles of Filipino martial arts, the different kinds of weapons, his training. We also discuss the benefits and negatives of training several different styles. I have known Craig Sensei for many years now, and it was a great pleasure to catch up with him. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, <clears throat> if you uh, wouldn't mind, could you tell us about your uh, training background? Okay, for sure. Well, thanks for uh, having me on, uh, James. Well, basically, I uh, started in martial arts in the fall, uh, September, basically, in 1984. I started with at uh, Sabri Gojiru under uh, Shion ben, uh, Don Benoit. So basically, it was a Gojiru lineage uh, through the Bob Dalglish lineage, because uh, as most of the people that uh, we were basically teaching at that time kind of came for that core. And I basically tr um, trained, started that in that, and to this day, I still do basically my Gojiru uh, forms as well as a lot of the material as well. And uh, several years later, actually it would have been 1996, um, I had my first exposure to Filipino martial arts. Um, and uh, basically from then, because Sodbury at that time being more of a karate town, uh, there wasn't really a lot of um, basically people around that were doing Filipino martial arts. And of course, back in the 90s, there wasn't internet, there wasn't anything. And so I just practiced the material I happened to learn from a seminar. Um, it was actually at that time I was training with uh, at Mike McGuire's uh, school, Sudbury School of Martial Arts, which I run now. And uh, Darren McGuire happened to be doing movies with a gentleman that option that did uh, Kelly De Leon under June De Leon. So they actually hosted him, brought them up to Sudbury. And that was my first exposure to Filipino martial arts. And I just, uh, it just felt comfortable, it felt right. And then several years later, um, I happened to pick up a black belt magazine and Remy Prasis, the founder of Modern Arnis, he actually was in Toronto. So I drove down, uh, did the seminar and actually met my teacher very briefly at the time, uh, Dr. Tim Hartman. And of course, uh, at that time, I didn't realize how close he actually lived. So, and obviously being Canadian, I wanted to try to stay in Canada. So I started looking around for modern East because I liked the mixture of modern East because it blended very nicely with the Gojiru that I came up, you know, from the 80s in. And uh, because a lot of the movements were very similar and they, they just meshed very nicely. So when I started looking around, I ended up meeting a gentleman in London and uh paul dowdy and i trained with him for a, few, a couple of years and he actually used to host um, my teacher as well dr tim so at that then i started getting to know tim more often and then i ended up uh basically starting training full-time under dr tim hartman in it would have been the spring of 2005 and i've been with basically training with them ever since and uh, over time, um, he went from modern Arnis to Prasis Arnis because the family itself has three brothers. And he was the oldest brother, Remy. He was his teacher. Uh, sorry, Remy was his, uh, my, uh, my instructor's teacher. And then he also trained with the second brother, Ernesto. So now because we have a mixture of both systems with the core being modern Arnis, to show respect to the family, he started calling it Praesis Arnis. And the nice thing about the Praesis Arnis system that I always found really uh, messed really nice with the Gojiru because the movements, the, the stances are very similar, the movements are very similar, the hand positionings, uh, it's actually a very close knit range fighting compared to Gojiru as well. So it was a really nice fit, you know, when I started training it. And it was a um, with the second brother's material is very linear. 
but in modern nice we get in close and circle in so it just it was a really a uh, nice fit from there and i've been doing that so almost 14 years now i've been doing basically filipino martial arts uh, and obviously uh, blending in it with basically my gojiru that i started back in the 80s did you ever have any problems with uh, uh, certain like uh, positions or something leaking into each other? Like uh, your gojudo is influencing your uh, your Filipino martial arts, or your Filipino's martial arts influencing your gojudo? Um, there, there, there definitely is a, a, a nice cross pollination because a lot of times when we're doing movements. And just because I've been doing gojuru in the karate for, you know, we're talking 30, 34 years, 35, 35 plus years. Um, all of a sudden I'll be doing drilling and then something my gojuru would come out and say, hey, this is this. Hey, this movement looks like you know, this particular move from Kata Saifa. And actually, for example, tonight I was actually just working out with my son and we were doing a knife drill. And part of the movement with it, which is uh, called knife tapping, looks very similar to some of the hand positionings that you see in Saifa. <laughs> so, uh, I actually don't know a lot about the uh, Filipino martial arts. Can you sort of give us like a thumbnail sketch of what what they consist of? Or? Okay, for sure. So, so the Kormai system. So, Arnis itself is the national sport of the Philippines, and Professor Remy Prezes. He was the one that kind of rejuvenated the interest back you know, after the war and uh, uh, yeah, World War II. And he and the, the system composes of single stick, double stick. So um, there's staff work, there's dagger work, there's stick and dagger, um, which is basically a, um, a core of what my system comprises. If you go to other systems, there could be flexible weapons such as a whip. Uh, there could be sword and dagger. Um, there could be, a, we have a long sword in our system. So it's a heavy blade, uh, sorry, not heavy blade, but a heavy weapons influence system. That's our specialty. But a lot of the movements, the hand positionings translate very well um, uh, in terms of if I do a, a movement with a knife, I do a movement with a stick, I do a movement with my hand, you can see a, a really a simple interrelationship. It's not like I'm learning different movements for everything I do. Uh, so the Filipino arts obviously has the, a huge weapon component, but they also do a heavy empty hand component depending on which lineage you go to. Uh, there's Pan and Tucan, which means Filipino dirty boxing. So it's a kickboxing oriented type system that emphasizes uh, punching and kicking, as well as elbows and knees, head butts, um, as well as eye gouge. So it's more street oriented. It's not something for the, um, the sport. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We um, are, are we have grappling, which is basically dumog. So that's our stand up grappling. So it's our joint manipulation, as well. And then there's another art that's inside praesis, which is our kuntao and sikaran. So kuntao is basically Filipino karate, okay? Uh, it's a very forms generated or oriented system. And, and basically they do forms and they do bunkai applications. And then Sikaran is mostly foot fighting. So very akin to basically uh, Taekwondo. So most of the movements are basically uh, kicking. So <clears throat> what does is, what is training usually entail when you, uh, when you go out to practice? So but, um, in terms of basically my Filipino base or basically what I do as a core at the school. Are you uh, looking for a bit of both? Uh, let's, let's start with uh, what your personal training looks like and then like maybe uh, your how you teach it. And <clears throat> okay. So now obviously with um, what we do at the school, because we have a heavy, we also, you know, we have a, a strong Goju influence on what I do just hence because I've been doing it for 35 years. And the core of what we do with the praise our niece, there's a nice mix. And we also do a little bit of material with, um, through Shirakin. Uh, so Shirakin Jiu Jitsu um, is a stand up gra uh, grappling art and throwing art that I've been cross training with uh, Sensei Chris Workman in North Bay. And that actually it was heavily influenced through multiple lineages of Goju Ryu. 
So a lot of the training that we do is very partner oriented, uh, very drill or, uh, drill and technique uh, driven. Um, so when we when we practice, say for practice in our empty hand, we'll practice a lot of basically pad drills as well as empty hand techniques back and forth. We do a lot of stand up locking okay, back and forth. And then if we happen to do stick, uh, single stick, we, it's which is medium to close range, so it's very in tight. So we learn how to basically block the stick using the angles and footwork. Um, stick on stick, we learn how to basically disarm or take away the stick using the exact same moves. And we also learn how to basically, if I don't have a stick and the other person has a stick, we'll basically practice the exact same drill. So everything is very um, repetitive in terms of we have very similar movements all the time. Now, when we go do double stick, we do what's called Sinawali pattern. Sinawali means to weave. So a lot of the double stick patterns are basically huge anti-eye coordination and it's mostly long range. So long range means I can hit you in the hand, you can hit me in the hand. And we're not aiming at the body parts, you know, which is head, you know, body, legs, etc. So this works on a lot of footwork, hand-eye coordination and reaction. Knife work, obviously knife work is always close range and we can also work long range work in cutting limbs. And then when we start moving into the forms, either the Kuntel forms or the Gojiru forms, obviously we work on all the aspects of kata that uh, build, you know, stuff that basically you go through as well. Uh, work, working on your cadence, your timing, your focus, okay, your movement, your um, um, transitioning, etc. Like, and from there we work on applications. So a lot of our self-defense is very bunkai driven from the Gojiru forms as well as the Kuntao forms. And along with that, when we do our empty hand training, we have a lot of reaction based drills that when you start breaking them apart, you can actually see where they're hidden in all our bunkais. And a lot of the uh, empty hand techniques or our stand up grappling are very joint, joint locking uh, oriented. So basically all the standard locks that you see in a lot of systems, you see them integrated in modern East because Professor Remy Preces was a very good friend of Professor Wally J, the founder of Small Circle Jiu Jitsu. So there was a lot of influence in our locks and that's uh, um, where, and you'll see that in the curriculum. But along with that, we have um, modern niece has very simple throws, but the throws aren't akin to judo or jiu jitsu. They're more of a, a takedown or a lock or almost like a trip where in our school we've added the shuriken jiu jitsu um, influence. And so in the bunkai applications, we see a lot of throws and takedowns from the shuriken aspect as well. So you you um, integrate all the uh, different things you do into your class or do you separate them as well or? Um, so basically they're integrated because a lot of them basically intermix together. Um, but obviously when we're doing like if we're doing, um, you know, if we're working on say Geki Sayech, OK, we're going to be working, you know, the stances, the angles, make sure there are all the structures. And if we're doing bunkine applications, sometimes I can pull from the other influences as well. OK, and when we're doing um, but a, there's a lot of stuff that is, that is very specific. Like if I'm doing weapons based material, obviously that's going to be priceless our knees because you don't see the weapons based influence in basically the Gojiru forms or the basic punching and kicking. But when I when you look at the basics, um, you know, our punches, our kicks, the Kuntao and the Gojiru, the punches are very similar, the same. They use you know, they use a, a basically shikodachi, they use then kutsudachi, they use the nikawashidachi. All those stances are basically common between the two systems. The big thing that's different between, say, the Gojiru forms and the Kuntao forms is the Kuntao emphasizes a lot of back stances, where we, you don't tend to see that in the Gojiru systems. But the nice thing about a lot of that is, especially when I'm, say, teaching outside of the school, and, if, and Sudbury still has a huge amount of Gojiru practitioners around, I can relate to the movements. So we have a drill basically called trapping hands. And trapping hands is literally a kakioki movement. 
So now I can take that particular movement and I can blend it into a reaction drill. And if I'm teaching somebody outside of my school that has a Goju background, there's a nice common point to say, just, okay, can you, can you show me a Kakiyuki? Can you show me a hook block? And then they can kind of relate to that movement. But in terms of what I take into school, I do individual. Okay, we're working on our Goju form. We're working on our basically braces, our niece material. But then you can interrelate the two of them together because the movements are very similar. Hopefully that answers your question a little bit better. Yeah. Um, do you have students who prefer one or the other or do they just do them all together? Or? Um, yeah, everybody, just like every, everybody has their preference in terms of what they like to do, whether there are forms, whether they're sparring. Um, and I find with the children, the children really like the Sinawalis, the double stick patterns, because it's very quick. It's uh, the hand-eye coordination, the reaction uh, gets you to move. It looks pretty cool. The kids really enjoy that. Um, I've got a split between uh, the adults. Some really enjoy the forms, okay? And it all depends on basically where the background is. I think um, the way I structure my classes is I'll focus on all aspects. So one night maybe basically sandata, which means our weaponry, which is our stick and our knife, possibly staff work. And we'll also do say stand up locking. And the next class will be all empty hand, which is our panatukan, which is our, our basically our, our Filipino dirty boxing, say mixed with our forms. And then when we do our forms, you know, we'll practice our forms and then we'll always integrate. We'll pick a couple bits and pieces out of the form and let's work on our applications. And that's when we we'll work on our throws, our takedowns, our joint locks, as well as our striking. I have an impression about uh, Filipino martial arts. And I wonder if you uh, could tell me yay or nay on it. Uh, okay. I, I always had the impression that they were seemed to be a lot more open to cross-pollinization of like uh, their ideas. They seem to be a lot, like Japanese seem to be a bit more uh, into their this is goju do and nothing shall uh, nothing will ever change. Yeah. But the but the the Philippine martial arts seem to be more open to picking up ideas from other people. Is that is that true or? Um, it, uh, definitely, I would com completely agree with that uh, that uh, basically comment. Just because um, you see a lot of cross training between a lot of systems. A lot of the stories that I hear it because if you look at the island. Uh, basically the main island of Luzon and there's all kinds of small little islands all over the Philippines and a lot of these islands had multiple different systems that came out of them and a lot of them were family arts so this system would fight against this system but over time everybody started kind of using other um, not necessarily maybe using but kind of borrowing and learning from other people like the founder of modern East, Professor Remy he learned his grandfather's system and then he also went away and learned Balintawak, which was his, the last system that he learned, okay, before he formed modern niece. And he was always open to other ideas. When he immigrated to the States in the mid-70s, um, um, he basically, basically uh, um, received a lot of influence from other people and he basically um, integrated that into his system. Like I had mentioned earlier, Professor Wally J was a very good friend of uh, his and they toured and trained together for years and he would basically, it took his locking to a new level just by training with Professor Wally J. And all the, you know, I've had the fortune of uh, cross training with multiple different styles of Filipino martial arts and you can see how everybody does basically cross train with other people and, you know, that way to enhance on basically their core base. It seems to me that they're even open to they'll they'll integrate uh, karate or kung fu or whatever they have access to. It. Oh, definitely, yeah. And I've seen that. Um, actually, I was just in the Philippines in February, and we've had an opportunity to basically. I got to go to a demo. Okay, I got to demo. Uh, actually, do demo with my teacher, and actually, one of the grandmasters there actually used me as his oki because you know, I'd I'd worked with him a little bit before, and we got to see all kinds of different styles of Filipino martial arts. It was a whole afternoon, and it was like a, an exchange of arts. Okay, everybody went up and basically demonstrated the respective arts, and you got to see 
a lot of commonality between all the systems and then also their their little uniquenesses. Uh, one of the ones we got to see was a little bit of Yayan. And Yayan, an easy way to explain Yayan is Filipino Muay Thai. Okay. But they have their own uniqueness in terms of how they do things and for my and they also compete against Muay Thai fighters. So it was really interesting to see that. And then we've I saw different branches of systems that call themselves modern and east, but then you can see how it's not the core of what professor used to do, but you see influences from other systems that come in. So oh yeah, you definitely you see every, everybody tends to train with with each other and they borrow and then they kind of make it their own. Just because every everybody, you don't move the way I move. My, a lot of my, you know, some of my students move like me, but some of them don't. So everybody has their will add their unique flavor. Okay, onto things. So what's like? Uh, I guess it's the purpose is basically self preservation because of the weapons being the most efficient way to defend yourself. Is that correct or? Well, I guess it depends on there's there's a lot of different history around things and the original if you look at the original way of training modern or East with the rattan stick was literally hitting the limb. So it was a very um, rough way to train. So if you were feeding me angles and I was learning how to defend against them, I would get hit in the arms and then. Over time, Professor Remy ended up changing that so we would block stick against stick. So the um, in if you a lot of the influence depending on where the islands come from, there's a blade a very blade oriented system, as well as a weapons based every as well as a stick based system, and I guess to say is a, most of the modernist uh, not modernist but necessarily Filipino martial arts. The second you walk into a class, you're picking up a stick, and a lot of those movements can be translated to a knife can be translated to empty hands, so they're very common, common movements. If you have some systems that specialize in empty hand system, they have straight punches, okay, the hooks, the crosses, elbows, everything that you see in what you do in your art. But there's some systems that do emphasize just a, a core focus on the weapons. You'll see them punching almost like they're holding a weapon, you know, in terms of the hand. It's almost like a vertical fist a lot of times. So every system has their own uniqueness in terms of what they emphasize on. So it might be, um, I guess it would be a hard question to kind of answer what the whole premise behind the weapons based. Uh, you know, there's a lot of the history that I'm still learning myself as I go time, you know, I'm always basically, you know, looking into where a lot of the information did come from. So how, um, how do they organize themselves in the Philippines in terms of like, do they have like organizing bodies or do they just sort of just at the dojo level or at the training hall level or I think it's a little bit of both mm -hmm. um there are overseeing boards uh depending on whether you do um just like just like pretty well everything just like karate taekwondo basically all the other martial arts you got your you know your martial art your martial sport and your martial combat right so if you got your mar um modern East, uh not modern East, sorry but arnis as a whole is the national sport of the Philippines. So there is actually a sport aspect. There is an overseeing board. And um, there's some schools that just train for street self-defense. So they have their own groups. So there's multiple different organizing boards, depending on your style and your system. Um, just like basically what you see all over basically North America, same, same kind of idea. Um, there isn't one major overseeing board um, that oversees everyone. Um, what you'll see is if they're system based, like Modern Nice has the International Filipino uh, International Filipino Martial Art Federation, uh, Modern Nice Federation, sorry, Internet IPMAF. There's also a, um, which looks after a lot of the Modern Nice groups. Then there's another group, you know, there's the World Comaton family that's in the UK, in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, which is another group that actually our federation, the World Modern East Alliance, which is run by Dr. Tim Hartman. That's the organization I belong to. But we also have a, um, a kinship, you know, our brothers you know, with the other uh, organizations. And we always try to work together. But every style, 
basically has their own kind of organizing board, I guess would be the short answer. Um, this might sound like a really basic question, but uh, it, the different um, names for the Filipino martial arts, are those dialectical differences, like the different languages of the Philippines, or are they, they mean the same thing? Or Yeah, well, when you look at there's Cali, Escrima, and Arnis are basically, they all mean the same thing in terms of basically where they came from. Uh, like Arnis means our arms, okay? Um, basically, so it, there's a lot of Spanish influence and a lot of the Filipino dialect. Tagalog is the, is the basically national dialect of the Philippines. And you'll see um, a, that's basically where a lot of the names do come from. But also there's a lot of Spanish influence. Uh, that's where the Escrema, okay, comes from. So because there's a lot uh, the Spanish influence, a lot of the Spanish uh, sword and rapier type movements, which could be our spotty idaga, which means basically stick uh, sword and dagger. So you see a lot of Spanish influence on a lot of the terminology. But a lot of times some systems call their names basically a lot of times they say from the regions. OK. Um, and Professor Remy called his system uh, Arnis. Um, back the I think it was back in the 60s okay and that's basically what it's been called ever since and in right now that is what you see as the that it's not the Kali or Eskrima is not the national sport it's Arnis is the national sport of the Philippines okay so if uh, people are interested in training are you available for that or yeah um yeah I um so basically I run Subway School of Martial Arts, and I have classes basically three nights a week um, for our core curriculum and kids and adults. And the emphasis on basically two nights a week, I run classes, uh, which is our core curriculum. So in our core curriculum, you'll do mano mano, okay, which is all the punching, kicking, blocking, striking, stance, footwork, movement, uh, trapping, okay. Um, then we've got our anyos or kata, okay, so we do our forms from the kuntao, uh, the gojuru in the adult class, and then we also do um, uh, form weapon-based forms. So, uh, and the, those forms basically come from Professor Remy. Uh, then we also emphasize our dumog, so a dumog is basically a generic term for grappling. So there's an influence, obviously, from the shuriken jiu-jitsu on our grappling, as well as the stand-up locking from basically Professor Remy. And then the sandata is our weaponry based. So that's our core. And then every Tuesday, we run a weapons only class. So the focus on weapons only is we'll take a drill out of our weapon based material and we'll work it and we'll break it apart and we apply it to sparring setting. So that's one of the things that uh, we do is we actually spar um, with the weapons. So we start off with a padded weapon and for those that are interested, we actually do migrate to basically sparring with basically live rattan. And so what we'll do is we'll pull apart a drill and apply it in a sparring setting. Do you wear like um, protective equipment for that? Or? Yeah. yeah, so anytime we spar, um, if we do empty hand sparring, which we do, we continue as kickboxing sparring. So it's basically foot, shin, instep, um, helmets and, gl and gloves. When we're doing weapons-based sparring, it's headgear uh, and gloves and obviously the cup as well for protection. And depending on whether we go live, uh, if we go live stick, um, I use emphasize um, elbow pads and knee pads just for those, those gloves. You know, in case you get a shot in the elbow and the uh, or the knee. So yeah, so we make sure we're we're fully fully geared up, so that way, um, you know, the uh, the person is protected from getting basically a thrust or a hit to basically the face. Um, so it's it sounds it sounds like there's a lot of stick, but there's also some knife drills as well. Is that correct? Or yes, there is. Yeah. So the emphasis on our knife. Um, some of the movements from stick can be translated to um, knife, but because of the the, um, the distance, the range, and the size of the, of the weapon, there's a little bit of you know changes. So we'll do basic um, knife work, which is um, unarmed against knife. 
hold up type work. Somebody just basically cutting and slashing at you. Um, we have our materials called EDT, which Edge Weapons Defense Tactics. It's a very simple base material. There's several police academies that kind of use it. And it's based out of um, movements out of our empty hand drills. Uh, one of them is called Hubud, which means tie and untie. So it's a, a gra basically a passing and controlling type movement. When we're doing knife on knife, we'll work. It's almost like a, um, almost like a knife dueling kind of movement. So we're working on distancing, reaction, grabbing, controlling, because obviously knife work outside of the dojo is very different than inside the dojo, right? So a lot of the stuff we're doing is, you know, trying to develop that familiarity with the weapon. So in case something does happen, you can react and hopefully get away safely. Do you, do you generally start with like teaching stick and then move towards blades or? Um, it's actually stick is usually the first. Um, literally the first time you step into basically our dojo, uh, you, um, you will be picking up a stick. Okay, we'll start off with empty hand basics just to get see where um, you know how familiar are with basically striking and punching and blocking. And then when we do our stick material, you'll pick up a single stick. Okay, you'll go through our basic striking, goes through our basic blocking, and basically basic countering. And then once you get from once you get comfortable with those base moves, we will progress over to uh, knife work and each level because we follow basically a color belt uh, system. Um, all the way up to black, uh, just as a progressive, basically, advancement. Uh, we have nine belts total, and up before we get to black, and each belt has a progressive knife, and then each one kind of piggybacks on each on each other. So it's a progressive movement. So the, um, is the ranking system something new, or has it always been in uh, the um, martial arts? Ranking system years ago, and to us, in terms of the belts itself, um, Professor Remy used a, a slightly different color belt system, okay? And uh, uh, so the one we follow is the one through the World Modern East Alliance. And actually, uh, I don't remember, I don't know exactly when Professor actually Um, since the 70s. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of uh, I had trouble hearing you there. What did, what did you say? Oh, sorry. So, um, so basically, uh, from my understanding, um, I know uh, Professor Remy had the belts um, back in the 70s, and he used it as you know, basically as a way of basically tracking people's progressions through the art. So the belting system has been around, from my understanding, since the 70s. I'd like to go back to, uh, so uh, how do you think that uh, your karate and your um, and your harness, how do they complement each other? What, were you th what do you think is the sort of strong points about merging them? I think a lot of it is if you look at um, the basic movements uh, when we're working on angles and distancing. So, like if you, in terms of my eye and in Philippine dialect, sayao, maintaining distance. And then you look at body shifting. The the difference, uh, the similarities are really nice because just the way the body moves. Um, you see the, the complement with the hands, okay, as well as the shifting of the hips. When I'm really up and close in my modern knees aspect, when we're doing close range fighting, if we don't emphasize hip rotation and twisting, just like in Gojiru, then your punches are basically ineffective. And then if you don't, if you drop your hands when you're in close range, okay, obviously it's going to be very ineffective. So by keeping your hands up in an okamai position, a trapping hands position, etc which is basically our kakioki, okay, in our blocking position, you just see all the movements are the same. And so if I sit there and say, okay, we're going to work on trapping hands tonight, and you see the movements, and then I say, okay, what if uh, if I do a kakioki movement um, from this form, where do you think you can apply the trapping hands aspect? Uh, we do movements in our pan and toucan, which look very similar to some of our Seonshin movements. And so one of the uh, one of my students 
um, because of the, her ability to kind of move her hands and rotate her wrists, I've actually added more of a pan and toucan flavor to the bunkai application Siyunshin for her because she can't grasp uh, in a particular way. So I get her to rotate and I'll get, a, and her, get her to do more of, say, an eye gouge or an eye rake instead of a trapping and a grabbing. So because the, the movements look so uh, similar, you can start kind of, well, seeing, okay, if I'm doing Gojiru movements, this is the bunkai that I originally did but it looks so much like this movement in this particular drill what if can i mix the two together and a lot of times they mix very nicely and then you can make a decision on which one you like better i guess yeah exactly and just and a lot of times when i was coming up through the ranks in gojiru when we were looking at bunkai applications because of the person's size the person's physical ability the way they can move your bunkai for a particular move might be a little bit different than mine just because I might not be able to do it because you're a lot bigger than me. So now when I when I start taking things is, you know, we can, uh, you know, have a blocking aspect, a locking or grabbing aspect, or possibly even a throwing aspect of the movement in the form. And so when I when we start doing our specific drills that are working specific attributes or specific techniques, then we start breaking things down well, if I sit there and I, I go to hit you, well, the the tech, the the, app, the bunk application, I go one, two, bang, and I hit you in the head. Well, you didn't like that. So what if I go block check and you stop it and you trap it, which we do a lot of trapping in Filipino martial arts and very, and very similar to when we do khaki, which was kind of neat when I started doing khaki. Um, it actually helped me out in some of my, my Filipino drills, which was kind of interesting. And so now if you block it, the Filipino says, well, you just trapped my hand. Well, I'm going to slap that hand away and I'm going to continue my attack. So now the bunkai becomes maybe not just one, two, three. It could be one, two, three, four, five based on how you reacted at that time. Is it, <clears throat> did you find the... Uh transition difficult or you, you said it was kind of natural that things I, so I think I think I found um, the first time that I actually had the exposure um, it was just a small little taste of what they do and it was a different system but when I first got into modern Arnis and then obviously progressed into the, the Precious Arnis blend okay under my my, uh, my teacher um, the progression actually fit very nicely is if you look at the combatant aspect of Praesis Arnis, which was the second brother, uh, Grandmaster Ernesto, um, their stances are very long. Uh, they use a lot of Zen Kutsudachis, and obviously, and my lineage came more from the Japanese Goju lineage than the Okinawan, so my stances were a little bit deeper at first. So the transition was very seamless. Um, in the modern Arnis, their stances are very upright, akin to boxing. And their stances almost look like, you know, just a modified Sanchez. So the stances were, I, I went, I moved from, and in modern East, you see almost a Sanchez, basically a back stance and a sumo stance. That's kind of the core. In a, um, when we do the Komatan, which is a double stick, a lot of Zenkutsudachi. So the transition was actually fairly, it, it fit very nicely. And actually, one of my first uh, expo uh, when I my very first trip in 2009 when I went to the Philippines, I actually did meet a gentleman that was a Hanshi in Gojiru under y the Yamaguchi lineage, and he started actually talking. And he actually started doing uh, demonstrating some Filipino drills, and but he started doing movements some Sionshin. So when I talked to him on the side, I said, you were doing Siyunshin, weren't you? And he's like, yes. And, and then we started having that conversation. So it, 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 I always found it was such a nice fit because everything, there was such a commonality between the movements. Let's talk a little bit about your training in the, the Philippines. Uh, how many times have you gone so far? I've gone uh, five times um, to the Philippines. Yeah. So my, my teacher, uh, Tim Hartman, basically go... He basically goes to the Philippines every couple of years, and I've been going with him since 2009. So, and um, what are your impressions about training in the Philippines? Um, actually, a lot of times is 
when we first went, we were always obviously seeking out the core of our system, you know, the modern and the praises. And then a couple trips later, we got to see Balintawak, which is our black belt, a stick dueling, uh, close in range fighting system. Mm -hmm. And we actually got to see the birthplace where, where it actually originated from in the island of Cebu. And I think I enjoyed going there, obviously seeing where my roots come from, um, the history. Uh, we, we basically got to see Magellan's Beach, where basically Magellan who basically is part of the Spanish invasion to the Philippines, met his demise. I, I got to see, I got to visit the, uh, the family home where Professor Remy actually grew up on, um, you know, in Hinegran in the island of Negros. And I got, I got to, um, I, every time we go, we always visit basically Grandmaster Rodel Gook, who is basically Professor Remy's, he was basically one of his top guys in, in the Philippines when he left. So it, it really gets me to understand a lot of the roots of my system, which I really enjoy. Do you find the, uh, the level of instruction about equivalent to what you get in North America or is it? Um, it's basically, that's kind of um, a yes and no answer. And just like when we go around, we see people basically, you know, at our level, above our level, below our level, no matter what we go, where we go anywhere around the world. And uh, there's so many Filipino martial arts that have immigrated to the, U the U.S. I get some, f I have, there's so many to um, top notch instructors just in, in basically North America. I don't really have to go to the Philippines. W we meet and there's some, some phenomenal martial artists and those are the people that we tend to go and train with. And it always just enhances on basically our core base. But Professor Remy moved to the U.S. in, I think it was 1975. So a lot of his top guys were in the U.S. So, and, you know, my teacher, Tim Arben, being one of them. So I, I have, I'm very fortunate that I don't have to really travel across the world to actually get, um, you know, it, basically t uh, train with high caliber instructors. When we go, a lot of, it's a lot of the cultural aspect finding out our roots and then we and then we actually train with a lot of the uh, martial arts and there's a lot of phenomenal martial arts as well is it uh you probably don't have time to visit other people i would imagine not to are, are you allowed to do that with the uh, filipino styles like sort of go to a different teacher or oh definitely yeah there and actually that's highly encouraged like every um the first Basically, two trips, I guess you'd call it, the core of the people that we visited were all from a modern or combaton lineage. Um, but from my third trip on, on the third trip, we actually were involved with a, um, it was after uh, one of the typhoons basically hit the, uh, the Philippine area and there was a lot of devastation. So a whole bunch of different systems came together and did a typhoon uh, fundraiser. And we just happened to be in the Philippines and we were invited to basically go to the event. And from that, we actually got to meet mul uh, multiple different Filipino masters, okay, uh, gurus, which means teacher. And from then on, every time we go to the Philippines, we're, you know, we try to go and visit them from all the different systems. As, and I get it. there's so many different uh, phenomenal teachers and grand and grandmasters, masters, you know, gudos in the Philippines, because it's such a, a wide, a big area. It's hard to kind of fit them in all in two weeks. So mm -hmm. a lot of time, every time we try to go, we always visit same people, but we always see if we can get out and visit other people. I have friends of mine that visit the Philippines all the time. And they go out and they talk about their experience training on this particular grandmaster. I'm like, wow, I didn't even know this gentleman existed. And this time, actually this year, I actually got trained with somebody completely different. Um, when I was in Cebu, another grandmaster in Balintabok that I'd never trained with before. And it was a phenomenal experience. Um, <clears throat> so my impression is that... Um... The bulk of the teachers live in around the Cebu area in the southern part. Is that true, or is um, it, there... it all it all depends on basically where um, what area you're focused. Like so Cebu, you'll see a lot of people that do Balintawak. So Balintawak, so in Cebu, 
um, Cebu City, there's actually a street called Balintawak Street. And the founder, Anselm back on, that's where his first school was. Hence, that's where the name came from. So you see a lot of people that train in Balintawak come from Cebu. Um, there was a lot, and that's where we got a chance to actually train with three different grandmasters while we were there on our last trip. And if you go to the island of Lozon, which is where Manila is, you see a lot more um, diversity of other systems with a lot of modern Arnis and Combatant influences. And it all depends on basically what what area you go to. And again, um, even though I've, I've been there five times, I think I've only just scratched the surface in terms of the different um, people that I'm, I'd be able to actually train with. Because there there's so many. There's, um, well, I guess Manila is the largest uh, hub for flights to the Philippines. Yes. Um, so if someone was interested in going to train in the Philippines with some of these teachers, how would someone go about doing that, in your opinion? Well, um, a lot of these people are, um, especially with all the big, bigger organizations, are um, they're they're worldwide, they're globally, you know. So you can contact them basically through all the so social media, Facebook, etc., um, as well as websites. Um, but it all depends on basically what you were looking for specifically. A lot of times when you go, it's it's good to have an introduction. Just like if you go to, you know, when you go to Okinawa or whatever, it's you need to have an introduction to basically meet somebody. It's very similar there. You can, you know, a lot of times you just don't walk up and say, hey, you know, I'm Craig. Can I come and train with you? You usually have to have an introduction. And but there's so many people there's that do basically go to the Philippines. Um, unfortunately, I have a lot of friends and, and a lot of contacts now. So even if I wanted to go by myself, I, I have the ability to actually go and, and I'd be able to basically meet and train with a lot of these different people. But I think a lot of times if you want to go to the Philippines and train, there's specific areas that you do go and train. Um, the one area, if you want to like just like a, a taste of it and see you and you see a lot of really high caliber uh, martial arts right downtown manila there's rizal park which is right in the downtown core and every sunday morning a lot of the, there's all kinds of grandmasters that actually take a little corner of the park and that's actually where they run classes some of them do have you know privates elsewhere but this is kind of an open class so a lot of people actually come just to the park and train every sunday and so we and this is where we have had an opportunity to actually meet several of the some grandmasters from other systems by basically going to this park i think one of the main uh, advantages about uh, filipino martial arts is that uh, a large majority of them uh, speak english <laughs> it, it, it yes they do yeah a lot of and again, just like I mean, especially if it's your second or third, apparently professor, it was his fourth language was English. So, but most of the times is, yeah, there's usually isn't too much of an issue in terms of a language barrier whenever you train with the Filipino martial artists. Yeah. yeah it's one of the things that uh, Japanese martial arts is, uh, now I think it's getting a bit better, but, uh, okay. but uh, some of the older teachers uh, don't speak English at all <clears throat> and there are times if i know when we've gone to the southern islands um sometimes there is a little bit of that language barrier but we do uh so when we've traveled we've actually had people that have actually accompanied us so that way we can they can translate um like our last trip we actually had somebody come down to negros uh with us uh and to and we but uh, went to visit uh grandmaster Ro roberto Preces, who is the, la the third the youngest brother the only re um living brother and he doesn't speak any english at all so we needed a translator okay uh so when we when we visit him so you know so that's so and and that's about the only time we've actually really had an issue in terms of that uh, communication back and forth you know between a lot of our, our trips and our studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very uh, convenient, I think. Yes, for sure. So uh, do you have any uh, more trips planned for the Philippines? I know you just returned from, from it in um, February. Actually, but... um, we, we do have actually another one coming up in uh, 2021. 
Um, and we're looking at basically um, putting together basically a joint camp between the WMA and possibly some of uh, the groups through the World Combaton family. And we're going to basically ha- host our own camp basically in the Philippines. Along with, you know, our core training will be training with us, with Dr. Tim. There'll be some of the, the other grandmasters from the World Combaton family and the masters. And they're going to be, uh, when then we're also going to be basically also cross training with some of the, the masters and grandmasters in the Philippines as well. So that's uh, right now that's been uh, tentatively scheduled for the spring of uh, 2021. Um, perhaps I can get those uh, links from you and I can put them in the description if anybody's interested in contacting you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can basically provide all the information for sure. Ah, uh, so. Um... I guess, uh, is there anything you wanted to talk about uh, that you uh, feel needs to be said or? I think, I think we hit a lot of, a lot of aspects and, mm-hmm. uh, said, and, and even, you know, getting back to the, our core base, you know, coming from the Gojiru lineage and then seeing the commonality. Cause I, like I said, I've had, a, you know, I'd, I always say, I've had the fortune of training with a lot of people, you know, because I just I feel blessed when I'm able to actually uh, meet a grandmaster. Because unfortunately, a lot of them are getting to that age that they may not be around uh, very much anymore. I've missed a couple opportunities training with a couple people because they just happen to pass away before I have a chance to meet them. And the I think I've been fortunate in the art that I actually found because it was such a close knit fit. From original core and it's not like I had to completely unlearn things from my Gojiru aspect because depending on what system you go if you go more salad there's more circular and it may not have that perfect fit where with the modern niece combatant the price niece blend everything just fit in a nice neat little package and then when I started adding the shuriken jiu-jitsu it just enhanced on the takedowns and throws from modern all the trapping and locking and as well as the takedowns from go drew it was just a, a nice tightly knit package which was uh, and i feel very fortunate to be able to actually uh, be exposed to all these arts and put them all together and you know offer it to my students it sounds like you would uh, definitely recommend uh, cross training uh your karate with uh, a filipino martial art oh definitely and i've always been a very big proponent of cross training but i always to me you should st- stay with a core system obviously until you have a solid foundation if you just a li- do a little bit of everything at an early stage you don't really get a solid foundation i had an extremely solid foundation doing go you know a little bit of influences of jujitsu you know just because of you know other organizations but then the second that i was able to get my get into modern and you know in modern east of combaton and the price and east family it, it was just a nice fit and i definitely if you know i would definitely encourage it because it's it's an aspect that's one thing a lot of empty hand systems um if they do uh, um basically weapon based material it may be just patterns or kata okay Obviously, with Kubuto, you got a, there's a lot of presets, so it's a give and take. You get to actually use the the weapons in the modern in the Arnis or the Filipino martial arts. You're using the weapons to basically attack, counter, block, strip, take away, okay, choke, lock, control. Basically, you're using the weapons to all those different basically aspects of of an art. And a lot of times to be able to defend against a weapon, it's actually really good to be able to use the weapon efficiently as well. And it gives you a, a big advantage, in my opinion. Okay, well, th- thanks again for uh, agreeing to do this. And uh, well, I appreciate it. And I thank you very much for actually inviting me. It's great, to, great, great to see you again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah.